In this video, I'll cover the basics of the asset classes we'll become familiar with in this course. There are many different asset classes. The list that you see on the screen is by no means comprehensive, but it does include most of the prominent asset classes. This list covers almost every asset we'll examine in this course, so let's go through them. The first asset class we have is the money market. Now, the money market refers to the market for any short-term asset, and in finance, Short term is defined as one year or less. As a side note, medium term is often described as one to five or one to 10 years, while long term is anything with the maturity beyond that. But back to my point, any security that matures in a year or less is referred to as a money market security. This includes treasury bills or T-bills for short, uh, treasury bills are the short-term debt of the U.S. federal government. You'll undoubtedly discuss them in your financial markets course. We also have CDs, or Certificates of Deposit. CDs are certificates that you can get at a bank in exchange for a deposit for a fixed amount of time. When you purchase a CD, the bank compensates you with a low interest rate. These assets, like any asset in the money market, are extremely low risk, and therefore you don't get much of a return on your investment. So right now, as, as of the time when I'm recording this video, this CD, you would have to deposit $500 and, for at least for one year, and your return would be 1.1%, uh, not much above inflation. Next, we have commercial paper. And commercial paper is the short-term debt of blue chip companies. And when I say blue chip, I'm referring to the well-known large U.S. firms that everybody recognizes, like Coca-Cola or Apple. Because these companies are often profitable and unlikely to declare bankruptcy, the interest rate they need to pay their creditors who buy their commercial paper is very low. Now let's go ahead and click the term to see the current commercial paper rates by credit rating. So here we have the current rates for commercial paper with various credit ratings. So a double A rating. And as we scroll down here, you can see that there's really nothing besides double A credit rating. Uh, like I said, the companies that issue commercial paper are typically very low risk and double A is really the, the best, the second best rating that you can have uh, short of triple A credit rating. Uh, now, as a final point, commercial paper has at most a maturity of 270, 270 days or nine months. In other words, this is all short term. Uh, I think the... All right, next we have money market mutual funds. And money market mutual funds are similar to other mutual funds in the capital markets, except that money market mutual funds hold a portfolio of short-term money market securities. Investors buy shares of the money market mutual fund, and this gives the fund the cash necessary to purchase short-term assets for the portfolio. Let's see an example of this. So here I have the T. Rowe Price Government Money Fund. So T. Rowe Price is the investment company, and this is one of their many funds. So they'll, they will certainly have more long-term funds, but they also have several money market funds that you can invest in. So the Ticker here is PRRXX. All right, so the objective is capital preservation. Uh, their strategy is to essentially invest in uh, low risk money market securities. And here is their annualized return or yield. And we can see that over the past several years, their yield or their total return has been extremely low. This is characteristic of what we typically see for money market mutual funds. Low risk, low return. As I go down here, we can get a sense of what this money market mutual fund is holding. So here we have their top 10 holdings. So they're holding US T-bills, uh, home loan bank securities. Uh, we have some repos. Over here, we have a breakdown by uh, by asset. So this money market mutual fund, had, its portfolio is comprised 
of 47.6% U.S. T-bills. Those might be T-bills of different maturity, say one month versus three month. Uh, it also owns the debt of various government agencies, uh, maybe some some municipal uh, securities. Uh, we have some longer term securities, so some U.S. T-notes, uh, sizable percentage of repos, which I'll talk about in a second. And we can see their geographical exposure. This fund is primarily focused on the United States. We have a fund manager here, Joseph Linaw. I might be pronouncing that incorrectly, but notice here that he has a CFA. I mentioned that a CFA is very important already, so consider it if you're interested in investments. Uh, so this fund, like I've said, money market mutual funds, they are fairly low risk uh, because the assets that the fund is investing in are all pretty much low risk. Oh, and by the way, we will talk about all three of these later in the course. And as we go down here, we can see the uh, dividends being paid out, not much here. And finally, we can see the expenses, the expense ratio for this fund. So the gross expense ratio is 42 basis points, net expense ratio, 38 basis points. Uh, so this net expense base, uh, ratio of 38 basis points, this is something we're going to talk about later in this course several times. This, this is really the cost to you as an investor per year. It's the fee that you pay to invest your assets. So if you invested, let's say $100, 38 basis points or 0.38% means that you are paying 38 cents of that $100 to the fund every year. Uh, so a basis point is just one hundredth of 1%. All right, next we have repurchase agreements or repos for short. Now repos are short-term agreements to sell securities and buy them back at a higher price. I'll touch on those in about 10 seconds, but let me wrap up what also falls into the money market. Uh, so there are dozens of other assets in the money market. Those securities might include euro dollars, which are just foreign accounts denominated in US dollars, brokers calls, uh, which I'll talk about here in like a couple of videos, uh, but there's there's just a huge number of other securities in this this area. All right, let's talk a little more about repurchase agreements because of all those assets, this might be the the trickiest one to understand conceptually. So a repurchase agreement is an agreement where one party agrees to give up collateral in exchange for a short term loan, maybe a one-day loan or an overnight loan, or maybe it's a 10-day loan, something like that. Uh, typically, repurchase agreements are going to have maturities all the way up to maybe two years, uh, but they're, they're generally considered short-term. But there's a huge number of repos that actually they just have a time to maturity of one day. Now, repos are very commonly used to borrow government securities, and uh, I'll, I'll show you why that is right now. All right, now let's walk through a, an example of a repo transaction. So we have two parties, an investor or lender and a borrower. And the borrower here is the, the organization really driving the entire thing. They need some liquidity. They need some cash for a very short amount of time. Maybe they, they have an overnight need for some cash. This might be a, a, a commercial bank or something that needs uh, to meet some, some regulatory requirement. All right. So, first day, the investor or the, the lender offers $100 cash to the borrower in exchange for $150 in collateral assets. So, this is here to protect the lender in case the borrower defaults. They, they fail to repay the $100 in cash that, they're, that they owe the lender the next day. Uh, so, if the borrower defaults, the lender gets a certain amount of collateral let's say, uh, you know, $100 or maybe the entire 150 On day two, this process somewhat reverses. The borrower returns the initial principal of $100, but probably with some, some interest. So $101 is paid back to the lender. So this is your basic 
repo transaction. You have essentially a swap of uh, cash flows. You know, one party gets a cash flow today, the other party gets an, a cash flow at a later date with some interest on top of it. Uh, so this is the benefit of the repo. If you need some, some short-term cash, this will provide it. Now, there are all kinds of repos out there. The example I gave you was arguably the simplest example I could give you, but you can have all kinds of repos, like reverse repos, uh, which are just the reverse of what I showed you from each party's perspective. You can also have tri-party repos, which I might mention in a second. All right, let's talk a little more about T-bills. T-bills are arguably one of the most liquid assets in the world today, with trillions of dollars of them outstanding. Now, they're issued by the U.S. federal government to pay for national defense, Medicare, Medicaid, and all the discretionary spending uh, that the U.S. federal government might incur over the course of a year. And T-bills have at least five different maturities, 4, 8, 13, 26, and 52 weeks, which all correspond to one month, two month, three month, six month, and one year T-bills. Now, because T-bills are backed by the U.S. federal government, which is never defaulted, T-bills are often considered risk-free by economists, and therefore the yield or interest rate on them is extremely low. I'll, I'll talk about throughout this course why being considered risk-free is so great, uh, but for now, let's move on. In addition to being considered risk-free, interest on T-bills, so the interest that you earn on this T-bill, is exempt from state and local taxation, uh, which is very nice. Uh, now, in addition to T-bills, the federal government also issues T-notes and T-bonds, and it's important to know the difference between T-bills, T-notes, and T-bonds. As I've said before, T-bills are short-term assets, maturing in a year or less. T-notes mature in one to 10 years, while T-bonds mature in more than 10 years. Another big difference between T-bills, T-notes, and T-bonds is that T-bills don't pay coupons, whereas T-notes and T-bonds do. The coupons on T-notes and T-bonds are paid to the federal government's creditors every six months until maturity. The amount paid is the coupon rate times the face value of the bond divided by two. And we'll talk about that formula later on in the course. Uh, you don't really need to remember it for right now. For now, let's take a look at some T-bills. All right, I am on the Treasury's website, treasurydirect.gov. All right, so here we have all of the T-bills and other securities, if we want them, so T-notes and T-bonds, that have been issued to uh, really anyone who wants to buy them. So we have a four-week T-bill that was recently issued. This is a one-month T-bill, and... Each of these T-bills is going to have a unique identifier, also known as a QSIP. And we have an issuance date, a maturity date, so that's going to be four weeks in the future. And we have the rate that was quoted. Uh, so this is this is going to be uh, the, the actual interest rate, the yield on that T-bill uh, that you get if you purchase this T-bill. Now, one thing I should point out, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to see this in the financial markets class that you have to take in Ball, at Ball State, but these T-bills are issued through an auction, and you as an individual can actually put in a bid in this auction. Uh, you can do it two different ways. Uh, you can actually bid on the yield that you'd be uh, willing to pay, so the the smallest yield that you'd be willing to pay to purchase these T-bills, or you can just pay whatever the highest yield that is set by the, the Treasury uh, is. Uh, so if we look at some of these upcoming T-bills, so this would be, well, this 26-week one, this would be our, our six-month T-bill. Right now, the federal government is raising $51 billion by issuing these six-month T-bills. Uh, the, it was announced, they were announced on the 16th, and they are going to be auctioned on the date that I record this lecture, so 7-20-2020, and they'll be issued on the 23rd. So if you want to bid on these, you can actually create an account on the Treasury Direct website and actually submit a bid. Uh, downside here is that because T-bills are money market securities, chances are your, 
yield on whatever T-bills you win are is going to be very, very low. Now, I do have two final points on the money market. First, the big benefit of the money market is that the assets in this market are extremely liquid. I think you've seen that already several times. You can buy and sell them quickly for close to their fair value. The reason for this is because there's many investors around the world willing to buy or sell those assets. However, because these assets are very liquid, there's less risk of being stuck with a money market security that's defaulted on. Therefore, investors don't require a high return from the organizations that issue money market securities. In other words, because money market securities are very liquid and have a low probability of default, the return you get on them as an investor is very low. In many cases, the return on money market securities really isn't much greater than the inflation rate in the broader economy. However, because you're still earning a return, it's better to hold a portion of your portfolio in the money market as opposed to cash. The second point I want to make is that most money market securities are sold on a discount basis or at a discount basis. Uh, remember, so what does this mean? What does it mean when a security is sold at a discount basis. Well, let's go back to some of those T-bills that I just showed you. Uh, so these are the ones that have been issued already. So let's take a look at this six-month T-bill right here. So this T-bill, it was sold for a price of $99.93-ish cents per $100. What that means is that if you bought $100 worth of this T-bill, you would pay a price of $99.92-ish cents, and then at the end of this period, the six-month period, you would, pay, you would receive $100. In other words, you're paying less than the face value of this T-bill. Now let's move on and discuss two rates that everyone should know about if they're going to be buying and selling securities. The first is LIBOR, or the London Interbank Offered Rate. LIBOR has historically been one of the most important rates in the entire world because it's been used as the base rate in many different loans and fixed income securities. LIBOR has historically been calculated based on the results of a survey that's given out to major banks operating in London. The banks are asked what rate they believe they could borrow from other banks over different maturities. The results from this survey are pooled, the highest and lowest numbers are dropped, and the mean is calculated. That mean becomes LIBOR. Now, because LIBOR has historically been seen as the rate at which banks can borrow from each other, it's seen as a good benchmark rate. If a small savings bank is deciding what rate to offer to a couple that needs a mortgage, the banker might charge the couple LIBOR plus, let's say, 2% as the interest rate on their adjustable rate mortgage. A huge number of loans have adjustable rates with the base part of that rate being the LIBOR. So if LIBOR goes up, the rate that the, the borrower pays increases. So here we have an, a couple of examples of the, the current rates or the current LIBOR. Now, LIBOR isn't just important for its own sake. It can be combined with a T-bill rate to create something called the TED spread. And the TED spread, it's not named after a guy named TED. Rather, TED stands for Treasury Euro Dollar Rate, which is something I'll never ask you to remember. Something you should remember, however, is that the TED spread is one of our best measures of market uncertainty. Let's take a look at why this is using some data. So here I am on the Federal Reserve's website, or rather the, the St. Louis Federal Reserve's website. If you ever need economic data from the United States, chances are that data is going to be found on this website. Uh, it's colloquially named FRED. Uh, this FRED database, uh, it, it has information not just on the TED spread, but on just about every every uh, piece of economic information like GDP or uh, labor information, uh, unemployment, etc. You're, you're going to find it on the FRED website. All right, now let's take a look at the TED spread. So as of the date I'm recording this, which is, well, July 20th of 2020, uh, we can get a sense of the historical TED spread through time, 
And up here in the several month period prior to when I'm recording this video, you can see a giant spike in the TED spread. Pretty interesting. Now, let me go back to, let's say, 2005. And you can see another time that the TED spread spiked in 2008, 2009. So what's going on here? Well, the TED spread essentially tracks market uncertainty. Uh, obviously, you can see during periods when there's a great amount of uncertainty in the marketplace, this thing jumps. And it's for two different reasons. The TED spread is the difference between the LIBOR at a certain maturity and the T-bill rate at a certain maturity. So if we're talking about the three-month TED spread, it'd be the three-month LIBOR rate. So this thing right here, so 27 basis points, minus whatever the current T-bill rate is. So you have this this line just represents the, the, the spread between the two uh, yields. Uh, any any spread is just going to represent the, the difference between two yields. Now, the wider the TED spread, or the, the larger it is, the more market uncertainty. And the reason for this is because when there's a large amount of economic uncertainty, essentially what ends up happening is banks don't want to lend to each other. Or if they do lend to each other, they're going to charge their the borrower bank a higher rate. So the LIBOR is going to increase during times of market uncertainty. At the same time, a lot of investors will start to sell their shares of stock and other assets and buy up T-bills. This causes the yield, the market yield on T-bills to shrink. It'll get very close to zero. So what you have is the LIBOR rate getting very large and the T-bill rate getting very small. So you see this gap forming during periods of market uncertainty, like the coronavirus outbreak or the financial crisis of 2008-2009. While LIBOR is incredibly useful to us as financial professionals, there's a major problem with it. Remember that LIBOR is based on the results of a survey, and surveys can be manipulated. And if that manipulation profits one of the banks that's providing data for the survey, that could be scandalous. Many of the banks that contribute information to LIBOR have trading arms that make bets upon uh, interest rates. And historically, the trading arms of these large banks are supposed to be separate from the other arms of the bank. But when there's money on the line, that really doesn't happen every time. In 2012, it emerged that some of the bankers that were contributing to LIBOR were communicating with the traders who worked for the bank and they were adjusting their survey answers to benefit the bank's traders. This means that the base rate in many adjustable rate loans around the world was being manipulated for profit. That's kind of a big deal. Now, if you want to see someone explain the LIBOR scandal in a far more entertaining way than I just did, go ahead and click this link at the bottom and you can see Stephen Colbert describe it in a way that only he can. This may be my favorite video that I like to show in person in classes. Uh, go get a pitchfork. <laughs> Okay, with the base rate in the wider economy around the world being potentially scandalously manipulated, uh, what can we trust? Well, there have been several rates that have been proposed in the last decade or so, uh, but one of them in the U.S. that is probably the most prominent and will probably be the, the replacement to LIBOR going forward is something called the Secured Overnight Financing Rate or SOFR for short. Now, SOFR is a market-based rate. Uh, it's a rate that's based on what investors are willing to pay for repurchase agreements rather than, say, like LIBOR, which is the result of a survey. In other words, the SOFR rate is a market-based rate rather than a rate that's based on the word of someone who might or might not be giving an accurate assessment of what they'd be willing to pay. And the SOFR has already begun to be reported. In fact, we now have several years worth of data so we can see how the SOFR responds to market conditions. So I'll click the second link, but if you want a 
good detailed description of how the SOFR is calculated, go ahead and watch this YouTube video. It's, well, it's more detailed than I think you really need to know for our course. All right, so here's the SOFR information. So if I expand this out as far as it will go, we should have a sense of how rates have changed or how the SOFR rate has changed historically. So as I've said, uh, rates are typically affected by market conditions and the SOFR rate, as you can see, it's fallen off a cliff just really since the, uh, the coronavirus crisis hit and it'll probably stay pretty low going forward. All right, we've come to the next asset class at last. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right, uh, let's talk about some fixed income securities or long-term fixed income securities. Uh, as the name implies, these are investments that offer a periodic cash payment that may be fixed in dollar terms or vary according to some predetermined formula. Assets in this class mature at least a year after being issued. The asset class includes bonds, which are just long-term debt instruments. Now, bonds come in many sh shapes and sizes, but they're generally fixed income investments in which one party loans money to an entity which borrows those funds for a defined period at either a fixed or variable interest rate. The T-notes and T-bonds I mentioned earlier are both bonds, uh, the U.S. federal government also issues something called TIPS, or Inflation Protected uh, Treasury Securities. Uh, federal agencies, states, and local governments also issue debt in the form of federal agency debt or municipal bonds. And finally, there are all kinds of bonds issued overseas and bonds issued by private firms. If you've not taken our financial markets or financial institutions course yet, be prepared to learn a lot about each of these types of bonds. In addition to bonds, we also have convertible debt securities. And convertible debt securities are just debt until the issuer decides to convert them to equity or shares of stock. Uh, the issuer is referred to as the borrower. The rate at which convertible debt can be converted into stock is specified when the debt is issued. Uh, we can also, in the fixed income securities marketplace, we can also see preferred stock and preferred stock just represents an asset that pays a specific dividend. That dividend doesn't increase or decrease, and a firm can suspend the preferred stock dividend, but it has to pay back all the missed dividends to its preferred shareholders before it can pay dividends to its common shareholders. Next, we have mortgage-backed securities and asset-backed securities. MBSs and ABSs are fairly similar, except that one is backed by mortgages and the other is backed by some other assets. All right, let's take a look at how an MBS or an ABS is created. Initially, a lender will issue a large number of mortgages to prospective home buyers. Those mortgages are hopefully given to borrowers with similar credit scores and those loans will typically have similar maturities. They might also be for one specific type of dwelling, like new single family homes in Utah. Once enough mortgages have been issued, those mortgages, which represent the amount the lender is owed, are bundled together. For example, a lender might bundle together 1,000 mortgages. The next step is to take that bundle and break it down into shares of a new security that's backed by all 1,000 mortgages. Those shares are sold off to a variety of institutional investors. And this process of pooling mortgages together and selling off a new asset that represents a claim on the future mortgage payments of borrowers is what we sometimes refer to as securitization. The value of the new security is dependent upon how many mortgage borrowers meet their payments and don't default. Let's take a look at this using a very simple example. In this example, I have five borrowers. So we have really five mortgages that some company has issued to some borrowers, and all of these individuals have different characteristics. So mortgage one, it's a 15-year mortgage, and the borrower has a 700 FICO score. Uh, mortgage four, 30-year mortgage, and the borrower has a 550 FICO score, which is way worse. 
just for reference, the, the highest FICO score you can have is 800. And I can't imagine people in the real world having a FICO score below like 300. All right, so those five mortgages are now issued. The lender might be a commercial bank or we'll say it's a savings bank. Uh, so the savings bank now has five mortgages that it will receive payments from. What it can do is take that pool of five mortgages, bundle it together, and sell off shares that are tied to the, the mortgage payments of each of these five borrowers. When that savings bank does that, we have a new MBS. And that MBS might be purchased or those or shares of that MBS might be purchased by, let's say, Lehman Brothers. Let's say they buy 40% of the outstanding shares. Bear Stearns might buy 30% of the outstanding shares. And JP Morgan might buy uh, another 30% of those outstanding shares. So pretty simple on the face. Now, the issue comes in when we have not just five mortgages, but let's say 10,000 mortgages. And all of them are slightly different and the organizations that buy those mortgages don't have a clear sense of the FICO scores of the borrowers in that, in that uh, MBS, or maybe they don't know some other useful information about the individuals that are paying those mortgages. Well, this is a pretty big issue because if they don't know what's in that MBS, they can't accurately value it. And this is one of the big problems that we saw during the run-up to the financial crisis. So Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, uh, both of these companies had purchased a large amount of MBSs. And they had dramatically overpaid for these MBSs. Uh, the problem here is that the MBSs that they purchased, a lot of them were backed by mortgages of individuals like Mortgage Holder 4. A lot of those mortgages might have been adjustable rate mortgages as well. Uh, so if rates rise, now you now that that mortgage borrower they're paying a higher interest payment. Their their payment has gone up, and they start to default. And the issue here is that as those defaults occur, the value of the underlying assets decreases, and the value of the MBS decreases. Uh, so. Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, which purchased a lot of these MBSs, they saw the fair value of those MBSs fall, and that meant that their debt-to-equity ratio rose because equity is just the remainder of assets minus debt on the balance sheet. And so Bear Stearns, they actually got bailed out. Lehman Brothers, when the value of their MBSs and ABSs fell, uh, they were actually allowed to default in September of 2008, and that actually sparked the start of the financial crisis. All right, the next asset class we have is common equity or common stock, uh, how, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, I'll, I'll just call it stock mostly throughout the class. And there's a couple of stylized facts you should know about equity or stock. Uh, first, common stock represents an ownership stake in the business. Uh, the more shares you own, the larger your percentage of ownership in the firm. I think everyone that's watching this video knows that. Next, stock also represents a limited liability for the firms that we're going to discuss in this class, primarily C corporations, S corporations, LLCs, and LLPs. As a shareholder of a C corp like Apple, you can only lose up to the value of your investment as long as you're obeying the law. For example, if you invested $20,000 in Ford and Ford went bankrupt and it had a really bad bankruptcy, let's say a Chapter 7 bankruptcy and there was nothing left after the bondholders were paid, you've lost your entire $20,000 investment, but no one is asking you to pay anything more than that. Next, stock represents a residual claim on the assets of the firm in the case of bankruptcy. This means that if the firm whose shares you bought declares bankruptcy, your claim on the assets of the firm comes after everyone else's. So let's take a look very briefly at that bankruptcy hierarchy. Now, the bankruptcy hierarchy is really just a roadmap of who gets paid first if a company defaults on its debt obligations. So typically, the firm is going to have to pay for filing fees for bankruptcy. It's going to probably have to hire additional lawyers uh, in the bankruptcy process. First thing that gets paid are the bankruptcy costs. After that, 
we have secured creditors. And the secured creditors are the bondholders that lent the company money, but the bonds that they received in return were backed by some assets of the firm. So it could be some equipment or some uh, accounts receivable, perhaps. Uh, generally, in the case of default, those creditors are going to be able to acquire whatever assets backed their bonds. Next to get paid are the unsecured creditors, and those are the creditors who purchased bonds of the firm, uh, but those bonds were not backed by any assets. Uh, typically, there's the bankruptcy hierarchy uh, for creditors can get really complicated. You can have senior creditors getting paid first, and then junior creditors. Uh, and then lastly, we have the shareholders, the stockholders. And they get literally whatever is left. If you're a shareholder in a bankruptcy case, typically at best you're getting pennies on the dollar for your shares. And that's that's a good case. Now, stock can also entitle an investor to dividends and capital gains. Nowadays, firms are also repurchasing their stock from investors. Uh, so what they'll do is, if the firm has excess cash on its balance sheet, it'll use some of that cash to buy shares of its own stock on the open market or through a variety of other methods, and it might actually cancel those shares. So now it has fewer shares uh, to pay dividends toward in the case that the firm does pay dividends. Uh, just as a side note, not every firm pays dividends or repurchases its own shares. In fact, the number of firms that actually pay dividends is, it's actually shrinking. More firms are actually electing to repurchase their shares. Now, another thing that you should know is that it's possible for one firm to have different types or classes of common stock outstanding at the same time. For example, Berkshire Hathaway is famous for the price of its Class A shares. Let's take a look at this by going to Yahoo Finance. So as I'm over here on Yahoo Finance, let's take a look at Berkshire's Class A shares. So Berkshire's ticker symbol is BRK, and we'll look at their Class A shares, Berkshire Class A. And here we have the price of what I believe is still the most expensive share on earth. Uh, so Berkshire's Class A shares are right now trading for $284,000 and change. Uh, you might be familiar with the uh, person who's most commonly associated with Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett. Most of his wealth is tied up in these shares, uh, which is why he's one of the wealthiest people on earth. Berkshire is famous for never paying dividends. They constantly reinvest whatever cash the company has earned into new operations. They don't pay dividends. They uh, historically, up until recently, have not repurchased shares, uh, and that has led to a dramatic increase in the share price. Now, in addition to these Class A shares, Berkshire also has Class B shares. And these shares are worth a lot less. They're only worth $189.95 at the time that I'm recording this video. So the question is, what's up? Why are these shares worth so much less than the Class A shares? And the reason is really two things. First, they entitled the owner of these shares to a smaller portion of the ownership of the company. And they also entitled the shareholder to a smaller portion of voting rights. And that is actually the final point I want to point out with respect to stock. Voting rights are one of the most important points that you should know about stock. Most shares of common stock will come with voting rights, but some shares of common stock will not come with voting rights. Uh, most of the shares of stock that you see trading on the S&P 500, those shares are going to allow you to vote at the annual shareholder meeting. But there are some companies out there like Snap, the company that owns Snapchat that don't entitle you to vote in the annual shareholder meeting. Uh, the reason the shares that you buy of Snap don't allow you to vote in the annual shareholder meeting is because those are actually, uh, Snap actually has several share classes. The founder of Snap and some of the early investors, they own the entire 
stake of voting shares, whereas the shares that trade on uh, stock exchanges, they are the ones that don't offer voting rights. All right, so why do voting rights matter? Well, every firm is going to have an annual shareholder meeting, or at least every large firm, every U.S. publicly traded firm. Uh, at that meeting, shareholders are entitled to vote on several issues, including who the firm's directors should be and whether the firm should change its auditor. The value of your votes depends on your voting rights. So let's take a look at what happened in Berkshire Hathaway's shareholder meeting in 2020 by visiting a site that you should become very familiar with, the SEC's data repository, or EDGAR. Now, the EDGAR database is one of the most important tools that you have as a financial professional. If you're looking up a security or a company or even a managed fund, you can find information on it here. So let's go to company filings and we'll go for the full text search and we'll type in Berkshire Hathaway should be the first thing to come up. And we'll go down to the company's DEF-14A. Now, the DEF-14A is the statement that defines what's going to be up for election in the firm's annual shareholder meeting. So here, the, here is the most recent DEF-14A for Berkshire Hathaway. And I'll just go ahead and open the document, and we can just take a look at it very briefly. Uh, so here is the statement where Berkshire is announcing where and when its annual shareholder meeting is going to be. This is really one of the biggest events that actually happens in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, every year. Uh, most of these shareholder meetings around the United States are going to take place in the spring. So uh, this was the date of theirs. And the purpose is to elect directors of the firm, hold an advisory uh, vote on executive compensation. That's another fairly common thing that comes up for a vote. Uh, and then there's a couple of other matters here. Uh, so here's a statement of what's going to happen. And if we scroll down here, we can see the directors that are being voted on. Uh, so obviously Warren Buffett is going to be voted on. It would be shocking if he was not reelected uh, as long as he wants to be on the board. And then you have a couple other individuals, so his son Howard Buffett, uh, and then several other people who are longtime uh, members or uh, executives with Berkshire Hathaway, uh, the big one being Charlie Munger. So if you want to vote on whether these people actually get reelected to the board, you can always show up. The next asset class we have is managed funds. And this asset class consists of more than what I have listed here, but some of the most important managed funds are mutual funds, ETFs, and hedge funds, which is why I'm going to talk about them now. A mutual fund is a heavily regulated portfolio managed by a professional. It pools the cash provided by investors and invests in stocks and bonds. Mutual funds are required to report their holdings at the end of every quarter, and mutual funds are often expected to have active management. In other words, they have to buy and sell securities fairly regularly. They can't just track the S&P 500. So obviously this is a little different from ETFs or exchange-traded funds in that ETFs track a basket of assets like the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 or the 30 stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, the key difference between ETFs and mutual funds is that ETFs are passively managed, whereas most mutual funds are going to be somewhat actively managed. Passive management is certainly less intense than active management. Uh, with a passive management style for a fund, the fund manager isn't attempting to buy or sell stocks to time the market. They're not trying to identify undervalued or overvalued securities. Rather, a passively managed fund is simply holding the same bundle of assets through time. The only time a passively managed fund like an ETF changes its portfolio is when an asset leaves the bundle. So for example, 
Standard & Poor's drops a stock from its S&P 500 index, the ETF that tracks the S&P 500 index will sell its shares of that stock. Actively managed funds do what you might expect a, a fund manager to do and try to time the market and buy undervalued securities and sell overvalued securities. They hire analysts and purchase unique data sets to calculate the intrinsic value of each security. Most mutual funds, as I've said, are actively managed. Hedge funds are also actively managed. Whereas mutual funds are heavily regulated and usually restricted to holding stocks and bonds, hedge funds are allowed to take almost any strategy they want. They can invest in almost any asset class they want. They don't have to report their holdings publicly like mutual funds do. And one consequence of this is that hedge funds are often more risky than mutual funds. Some hedge funds will buy bonds of firms or countries that have defaulted on their debt in the hopes that they can actually sue the country and get them to repay more of their debt than they were otherwise going to. Other hedge funds might buy the majority stake of a firm and attempt to turn that firm around by increasing the price the firm charges for its products. So if you're familiar with anyone who's, done, who's used this technique, that would probably be this guy, Martin Shkreli. He's also known as the pharma bro, or the guy with the most punchable face in America. He ran a hedge fund that purchased a pharmaceutical firm uh, that produced a treatment for malaria. And when his hedge fund bought up this company that produced this malaria drug, they increased the price of the drug by 5,000%. This is obviously legal, it's just not a decent thing to do, as most people might say. Now, this technique is one of thousands of techniques that are employed by hedge funds. These funds are in many ways the wild west of investments. If there's a crazy strategy out there, a hedge fund has probably tried it. The next asset class we have are derivatives. And as their name implies, derivatives are securities that derive their value from the value of another asset, like a commodity or a bond or a stock or a market index. Uh, in this class, we'll talk mostly about two types of derivatives, options and futures contracts. Options give you the right to either buy or sell an underlying asset at a previously agreed upon price called a strike price. Futures, on the other hand, are agreements made today regarding the delivery of an asset at a specified delivery or maturity date for an agreed upon price called the futures price. Uh, to be paid at maturity. The price that you hear quoted for commodities like oil or corn is the price of a futures contract. Futures agreements allow one party in a transaction to lock in the price that they get paid in the future to produce a specific commodity. So they're great for hedging risk. As a farmer, if you're producing a bushel of corn, then you might want to lock in the price that you're getting paid at the start of the season. So futures contracts allow you to do that. Finally, there are a variety of other investments and asset classes that we'll spend less time on in this course. Uh, throughout this course, I'll mention a variety of tax-advantaged assets like municipal bonds and T-bills. Uh, when I say they're tax-advantaged, that just means that they're exempt from state and local taxes. This means you don't have to pay taxes on any profit that you earned from these investments. So if a bond pays a coupon to you, you don't have to pay taxes at the local or state level uh, for those municipal bonds. We'll also look at real estate in this course. As an asset class, real estate has a huge number of tax advantages. Finally, I'll briefly discuss tangible assets and how to incorporate them in portfolios. However, most of the coverage you're going to get on tangible assets will come in your Finance 490 class. All right, now let's try a CFA question to make sure we're all on the same page. So which of the following is least likely a pooled investment vehicle? Asset-backed securities, convertible debt, or hedge funds? Well, we've already talked at length about asset-backed securities. Remember, those securities are securities that are tied to the value of some large group of assets. Just like mortgage-backed securities are backed by a bunch of mortgages, asset-backed securities might be backed by auto loans or something like that. Uh, so you're pooling a large amount of loans that are going to be repaid through time, and therefore 
A is not the correct answer. Hedge funds, those funds, they take investments from hedge fund investors, uh, high net worth investors. We'll talk about who is allowed to invest in a hedge fund later on in this course, but basically you have to be fairly wealthy to be able to invest in hedge funds. Uh, now, hedge funds take those assets, pool them together, and invest in the risky uh, strategies I've just discussed. So in this case, hedge funds are not the answer. The correct answer here is B. The reason it's B is because convertible debt is just a form of debt that's been issued to anyone who wants to buy that debt from an organization, uh, let's say a private company like Apple. Apple can issue convertible debt, which is just debt that if they want to convert it into shares of Apple stock, they can at a set uh, conversion price. So that's that. So let's recap. I did touch on many different asset classes and there are a couple of stylized facts that you should know about each. Uh, obviously, see the slides and see, you know, review the lecture I just covered. Uh, I tried to hit on the most important points. We'll go deeper into most of these asset classes throughout the course. So obviously, get ready. Uh, what you saw today is just kind of a precursor to what is to come. Uh, so, for example, you should know that the money market contains uh, the most liquid assets of all the asset classes. I think the money market. Most of our coverage did come today. Going forward, we'll start to focus primarily on stocks, bonds, uh, and then managed funds, and then options. Next, you should know that the TED spread measures market uncertainty. A high TED spread means a large amount of market uncertainty. A low TED spread means that investors are feeling very secure. Uh, obviously, you see the uh, part of the video where I discuss that. Next, you should know some stylized facts about common stock. Obviously, we're going to spend a fair amount of time on common stock and valuing common stock and uh, putting common stocks into a portfolio and then optimizing that portfolio, so get prepared for that. And then finally, you should know that all managed funds pool the assets of investors to create a portfolio. Uh, so if you buy into a managed fund like a mutual fund or hedge fund, you are buying into a portfolio that's fairly well diversified, particularly if it's a, a mutual fund. All right, so with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll see you on the next video.